Today we're continuing our series, series, Discovering the Wonder of Christmas. Discovering the Wonder of Christmas. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but it's been refreshing to me as we've gone through this series to understand that there's a lot of wonder that doesn't necessarily have to be a worldly type wonder. In other words, it doesn't, it's not involved in a tree, it's not involved in the lights or the presents or the wrappings. It's the wonder of why we celebrate this season to begin with. It's the wonder that we as Christians should know but often get sidetracked because of pressures and pulling and influences in so many different ways. I thought that's one reason that we needed to kind of focus back and, and look at the wonder that Christmas brings. Because sometimes I feel like as Christians we allow the world to steal the wonder of Christmas. We talked about the wonder of a star, the star shining brightly, but because nobody was really looking, they didn't see the wonder of it, so they didn't see Jesus. And I wondered about us, how we're seeing the signs of Jesus all around us and what God is doing in our hearts and lives. Or are we so confused and we're so blinded by the circumstances of our present situation that we don't see the star that's shining full of hope and encouragement. We talked about the wonder of a name, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. We talked about how powerful that is. <clears throat> we talked about the wonder of a manger, how Jesus wanted to rule. The sovereign king of the universe chose to come into this world in a humble, meek, and lowly status. He chose the manger as a symbol of how he would rule. Not on a throne, but a throne of meekness, being mild, considerate, compassionate, loving. Today we're going to be talking about the wonder of a promise. The wonder of a promise. And I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had someone to promise you something? That's a question. You can answer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Y'all are going to be slow this morning. I, I can tell you it's going to be one of those mornings. So. Have you, have you ever made a promise to someone else before? Yes. What well, usually accomp uh, accompanies a promise? Well, follow through is an attribute of a promise, or maybe you want to be a, a promise. What about, what's others? Trust. Marriage. Trust. What? Marriage. Marriage is part of a, a promise as well. Promise is something that, when it's given, brings hope. Promise is something that brings anticipation. A promise is something that helps us look beyond our current status and challenges us or encourages us to take a step forward to the next place. You know, oftentimes we exist in the present. We allow facts to determine the present. And what happens is, is when we allow the facts to define us, we exist. We just exist. But a promise, a promise brings life. A promise helps us to thrive. A promise brings ambition. And it brings something to live for. Something to live and go to. The wonder of a promise it's so prevalent at Christmas and sometimes yet I think we overlook the promise that was given with Jesus when he was born. In Isaiah 7, 14, all the way back in the Old Testament, there was a prophet, his name was, it's Isaiah 7, 14. There was a prophet back in the Old Testament, his name was, y'all are so sharp today. Mm. This prophet was chosen by God to speak to his people. Yet, a lot like us, he felt like he was unworthy. Anybody ever felt unworthy? Be a prophet of God. Mm -hmm. And he felt unworthy. And, and God, through the Spirit, dealt with him. And he says, I'm unclean. My lips are unclean. He, and he went to the brazen altar and he took the tongues and he took a piece of coal, purified his tongue, and said, you can do what I've asked you to do. 
you're going to do what I've asked you to do, right? And he says, yes, Lord, here am I, send me. So as we look at Isaiah, we see in chapter 7, verse 14, a promise that's being given. Now this is to a children of Israel that is in rebellion. This is to a whole nation that is losing their way because they don't have anything much they want to live for because it seems like they're just existing. They're living by facts. And Jesus, I mean, God comes along with his prophet and he says, hey, I want you to deliver a message to my people. Here's some things that I want them not to do. They need to discontinue doing. And here's some of the things they need to start doing. And by the way, I want to give you a promise, a promise to deliver to them that they will understand that I will be with them no matter what. A promise that will give them hope. And it may not come to fruition right now, but a promise no matter how delayed, is still a promise of hope in a future. And he said, deliver this promise to the children of Israel and see how they respond. Isaiah 7, 14 says, therefore the Lord himself says, we'll give you a sign. This is a sign of the promise. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him and you will call him Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean, by the way? God with us. Now, what's the sign of this promise? We'll be born of the virgin. What's the promise in this verse? Not the son, not the birth, but what? What's the promise? God with us. God with us with us. This is the promise. And sometimes we lose sight of that, especially because we worship the birth or we worship the virgin or we worship a lot of other things. But the fact of the matter, the promise is what gives us life. The promise is what gives us hope. The promise is what we cling to. The promise, of course, is God with us. God with us. Why is that so important? God with us. Why is that so important? Because we as people like company, don't we? We don't like to be stranded and alone. We don't like to feel like we're abandoned. We don't like to feel like we're facing the world by ourselves. We need somebody to support. We need someone to encourage. We need somebody to be present, especially in their time of need. Guess what scripture says? That God is faithful. That Christ is faithful. That the Holy Spirit is faithful. That he is our ever-present. He is our ever what is it? I forgot now. He is our ever-present help in the time of need. That's what it is. Ever-present help in the time of need. God is with us. This is the promise that came at Christmas. And I wonder if we're losing the wonder of the promise because we get so caught up with the mechanics that we're failing to see what God has promised. Long time ago, way before Christ prophet was given a promise, you'll have a sign, the sign is the virgin birth, the son will embody God, and God, he shall be called Emmanuel, God will be with you. Say, God's with me. Here's the beauty part about this promise. The promise came for all peoples that would receive Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And just a side note here, this sign, the virgin birth, is very important. It's very important. And there's a lot of religions and denominations that call themselves Christians that want to take away the virgin birth or not acknowledge the virgin birth. And I think that's very dangerous. Here's why I think it's very dangerous. Because all through from the beginning of the Old Testament to the end and Revelations talked about the Son of God and the sign of the Son of God being that of a virgin birth. And if you take the virgin birth away, there's not much left to hang your hat on because that is the sign that authorizes the introduction of the Son of God. Amen? Amen. That's just, a, that's really no any part of this sermon, but I thought I'd throw it in there for good measure. It's good theology, okay? What is a promise? A promise is an assurance that one will definitely do Give or arrange something that you will undertake and declare that something will happen. 
It's important that a promise means that something will happen. Have you ever had somebody promise you something that nothing ever happened? What do you consider about that promise? It was a dud, wasn't it? Have you ever made a promise that nothing ever happened about it? Was it did it work out well for you? Most of the time not. Promises are only as good as the activity or the action that comes along with it. For example, we promise stuff all the time, don't we? And we have things promised to us all the time. Matter of fact, if you get a job, what you're really doing is, and you go interview, that employer is saying, look, if you come, work, be here on time, do your assigned task, at the end of the week, we promise that we will remunerate you at X amount of dollars, so to speak, for that service. That's a promise. Now, at the end of the week, if you fulfill those criteria, usually they give you a paycheck. That's an action on that promise that makes that promise good, right? Same way, you promise when you go into an employer, say, you know, I see what you're going to promise me, and I will promise you I will be on time. I will work and do all the things you've asked me to do during this allotted time for the remuneration that you're talking about doing, and I promise to do that. And that's a promise that we make. But a lot of times, employers and employees, they don't live up to their promises, do they? Hmm. But that's not just one promise. When we get married, I believe somebody used the marriage thing, we promise and then take vows. And by the way, in a marriage ceremony, there's a lot of elements in a marriage ceremony, and the promise is the first one. It begins with a promise. It's a, there's a welcome, there's a charge, and then there's a promise. And each one is asked, will you have this man to be your husband, to love, to cherish, to forsake all others, and keep only unto him as long as you both shall live? And they say, I will, I do, yep, okay, <laughs> whatever, okay. Same thing with her. Those are the promises. After you go through the promises, and there's a scripture, usually a little homily and stuff, and then you get to the vows. The vows are where you say this to each other. Those are vows. But first comes the promise, the promise, okay. There's hope in the promise. There's future in the promise. There's vision in the promise. And there's actions that's going to take place from the promise. If you promised in the first part of the marriage to take this and you don't follow through with the vows, in other words, you don't say the vows, guess what? That's a promise unrealized. You're not going to be married. We make promises all the time about so many things. And for the most part, I would say we probably are pretty good at keeping them. Because usually promises are cause and effects. In other words, I promise you, and then because I promise you, you promise me. They're transactional in relationship. But this promise was given from God to say, look, this is a sign. He'll be born of a virgin. He'll be born laying in a manger. He's the son of God. His name shall be called Emmanuel, God with you. Now, the only other part of the requirement is, is that if you want God with us, the transactional part is, is that you receive this promise for yourself. That you receive it. How many of you know you can't receive a promise unless you act on a promise? In other words, when I asked this man if he was going to have this wife, he had to say, right? When I asked this woman if she'll have this man, she had to say, the transaction part is the acceptance of the promise and then the requirements that that promise brings to us. Promises are so important because they, ena uh, they enable us to see further than our current existence. See, a lot of people don't live in the promise. They live and exist in the facts. Facts determine what is actually happening right now. It's factual. We exist by facts. What happened to us and what is happening now around us is fact. 
but we live, we thrive, and overcome by promise. Everybody say by promise. By promise. We live, thrive, and overcome by promise. The promise of something better. The promise of something greater. The promise of something being more fulfilling. The promise of something being more accepted or loving or being more kind or fulfilling. This for us as people of faith is what we call the promise of hope. For Jesus says, I come to bring hope and a future for those who receive me. Another scripture says that we press for the high calling of Jesus Christ. We do this because of the promise in him that he will complete the good work that he's already begun in us through salvation. So the question is, how are we living out the promise of God that we know came through the birth of a son, the birth of a baby, the birth of a promise, the promise that God would be with us? How are we living that out? You see, I believe that we live out that promise not just by saying it, but it's by what we do with it as well. God with us. God with us. God with us. How many of you really grasp that thought that God is with you? How many of you know that Scripture says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit? We know that God is Trinitarian and the, and the fact that we know that God exists in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. When Jesus came, he was born in a manger, God with us. He was the physical presence of God. He lived 33 years, went on the cross, paid for our sins, went to the grave, and rose from the grave. We celebrate that at Easter. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? I'm, I'm an Easter person. I love Easter. And through that resurrection, he stamped authority on what he did on the cross of making sure that he conquered sin, he conquered death, and he said, I am the promise. I am the promise. Then he went and sits, he sat on the right-hand seat of the Father and sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit fills us as we receive Jesus. We're receiving his Spirit, God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Look at somebody and say, I got the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've never accepted Jesus, don't you be telling somebody that. <laughs> you only get the Holy Spirit when you receive the promise. And the promise and the hope is in Jesus, the Son of God. <clears throat> through the birth, through his life, through his crucifixion, through his burial, through his resurrection, and through his intercession that he has for us as believers. The promise lives in us. And he says that he'll be with us always. Guess what? If we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, everywhere I go, God goes. Amen. Everywhere I am, God is. When I walk in my workplace and there may not be a Christian there, guess what? God is with them also. Why? Because he's in me. He's in me. The promise being fulfilled in me is that I'm carrying this promise with me. It's a hope and a future and a promise that's housed in my spirit, in my being. And when I go and I'm walking in love and I'm walking the admonition and knowledge of Jesus Christ and walking in his love, I carry the promise to those who has been promised. So how are we doing with that? How are we doing with that? If you're like me, there are days that you do really well. And there are days we need to revisit the promise, right? And there are days we just wonder if this promise is too heavy a load. And there are days when we just want to stop and we want to quit. You know I'm telling you the truth. But the fact of the matter is, he knew that in the beginning. Because the promise helps us to thrive. And it helps us to overcome. It helps us to be what God has called us to be. And that is overcomers by the blood of Jesus. Victory 
is ours because Christ has already won it. So in this conversation, when we're looking for the wonder and we're saying, gosh, we're so confounded with the things that pressing in on us and circumstances that seem to rip our hearts out and relationships that not doesn't seem to be manifesting in its proper ways. And by the way, most of you are going to have Christmas with your families, right? I'm praying for you. Because if all of us have families that there's some people you just kind of hold your breath around. You know what I'm saying? None of mine. They hold their breath around me. We're, we're, pray, we're praying for you guys, okay? Because family sometimes is the most difficult dynamic of relationship that you can ever be in. Matter of fact, a lot of people will say their family of God is a lot closer than their physical family. And I believe there's a lot of truth to that. A lot of different ways. And I believe a lot of that is because we share a deeper promise and hope and faith than sometimes we do in our physical family. And there may or may not be true. I don't know. What about the promise? Have you discovered the wonder of the promise lately? Have you discovered and have you felt that you've never been left alone? He is our ever-present help in the time of need. Have you ever felt that he's abandoned you or left you, but it's maybe because you not realized the wonder of the promise. You've not gone back and revisited that and said, God is inside of me. God lives in me. He's not forsaken me. He is there. He is present. The only body that's left is you because of your mind. You've turned away or you've not been able to receive that promise in its fullness and the joy that he has for you. You're existing in facts instead of thriving in hope and thriving in the promise. And when we thrive and overcome and we realize the fulfillment of the promise, it releases wonder in our life. Have you ever done something and you thought at the time when you did it, gosh, this is not going to turn out too well. But by faith, you did it anyway when you thought it was the right thing to do. You prayed about it and you did it and you just thought it was the right thing to do. And you just were very concerned about it. But it, you did it by faith. And when you did it, all of a sudden, the tables turned and it, there just came a flood of release and joy. And, and you took your whole life to a different level. That's the wonder of a promise. That's the promise. That's what the promise will do. It teaches us. It encourages us. It shows us how we can live, maybe not how we are living. How are we living out the promise? I hope we're living out the promise by faith first. What's faith? Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Faith is the first action of promise. God says it's impossible to please God without, without, without faith. Without faith. Faith is the first ingredient for us to understand the wonder of promise. And it's the first thing that stamps out the deception and the lie of the facts. Listen, let me tell you something about facts. The facts may be that it's raining outside today. But the promise is the sun's going to come out tomorrow. Come on now. The sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar. That was sung in an old hymn book. I forgot what it was. It's called Annie. <laughs> I believe, I believe it was. The fact is it's raining outside. The fact is it's cold outside. The fact of the matter is it's messy outside. But the promise is the sun's going to come out again. The promise is that God will never destroy the world by rain again. The promise is that we have a hope in a future even though the rain is here and it's dampening our spirit and it's wetting our clothes and it's making life difficult. The promise is sunny days, brighter days, joyous days are ahead. Keep on pressing through. Keep on pressing through. See, we get confused. We live by fact instead of by faith. We live by fact instead of by promise. We live by fact in what we see instead of the promise of the future 
the evidence of things not yet seen by faith. First, to realize the wonder of prom the promise, you must have faith. The second thing is you must receive this promise. You must receive it. And how do you receive it? First of all, you've got to know you need it. How many times have you ever got something that you didn't think you needed and you took it seriously? I get gifts all the time that I don't need. And I'm going to tell you, I'll receive it graciously. But my closet's still full of gifts. Some of them have not even been unwrapped. They're not full. I've got one or two, okay. But that's an exaggeration of simply full. Uh, but I've got one or two gifts. And a lot of gifts I re -gi Did I say that? <clears throat> <clears throat> that's something I throw I'm sorry. But... <laughs> You get things all the time. Sometimes you don't need and you don't really receive them. What you do is you just kind of put them to the side or you give them to somebody else. Listen, to receive the promise, you must first know that you need the promise. Romans says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us, no, God, no matter how good you are, no matter how handsome you are, young men, no matter how pretty you are, young ladies, no matter how versed you are in you educated people, and no, how, no matter how ignorant you are, you rednecks like me. It doesn't matter where you are. The truth is that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And if you don't think that you need a promise, if you don't think you need a redeemer, if you don't think you need to be forgiven, if you don't think that you need a hope and a future, if you don't think any of these things, the devil has already got you deceived. Amen. And you're already defeated and don't know it. Right. You're walking in death and you don't know it. The Spirit of God is given to quicken man unto life, to give him eyes to see, ears to hear, and wisdom to understand. These are the promises of God for those who receive, but you cannot receive something that you do not know that you need. And we're all standing in the need of God's grace and forgiveness, and we all stand in the place that we need the promise of God being with us. We need Him. Amen. We need Him. You've got to have faith, and then you've got to have realize there's a need, and then you've got to be able to receive. You've got to be able to receive. You know, sometimes receiving stuff is so hard. Isn't it? It's so hard. It's really difficult when somebody wants you to receive something that's critical. Wanting to be honest with you. You know, boy, that was a good sermon. But man, I'm going to tell you, there's this one part. You use the wrong word. You might want to research that. And you know, you're probably right. But it's so hard to receive because what I want to say, bless God, that's the right word. You just don't understand it. <laughs> Quit laughing, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> we don't receive, we want to deflect, right? Because we don't want to be wrong. It attacks our pride. Everybody say pride. It attacks our pride. And, and the scripture is very clear about this. Men has this tendency to be prideful. Oh, by the way, men is neutral gender there. It means men and women. Okay, it's, it's not just us guys. You gals got it too. Okay. <laughs> we have this need to be right. So to receive anything that would be what we would call somewhat be downgrading or critical, it's very difficult. Now, on top of that, it's very difficult to receive grace, too. It's very difficult to receive a gift that's given out of love and compassion. Because, again, we're prideful. It works both ways. We don't like to be corrected in our pride, and we don't like to be blessed in our pride. Because... Bless God, I don't need your help. I can do it. I'll get her done. Just give me a little more time. Am I telling you right? Come on. So here's a good, a, good, a good test. If somebody gives you a gift and you actually receive that gift, tell me if in your mind you don't think, mm, now what can I get them? Am I right? 
Getting this gift, receiving this gift is very difficult and it's challenging. And if you don't think it is, you've got another thing coming. It really is because we fight it, we push about it, we do all kinds of different things trying to reject this gift as God. By faith, we receive it. We need, to re we need to know we need it. And we need to practice and understand how to receive it. How do we receive it? We receive it like Jesus came in humility, in love, with grace. Have you received this gift? Have you re Do you know what we're talking about in this promise? Some of you are, are so embattled with the facts of life and you're so embattled with the circumstances, you're missing out on the joy of the promise, the wonder of the promise. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says this, for y'all that are caught up in your facts, for we that are caught up in our facts and not living in the wonder of the promises, come to me, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and my burden, for it's easy and light. Wow. That's the promise of the presence. It's the promise of the presence, our ever present help. Mm. The last thing I want to talk about is we receive the promise and the wonder of the promise when we understand and have compassion on those around us as well. We share the promise. Matthew 9:36 it says when he saw the crowds he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless and like sheep without a shepherd they had no promise. They had no hope. We must recognize that for our promise to have impact on others, that we must have compassion for their story and where they're at and what they're going through. Through this compassion, through this presence, we get to unlock the wonder of the cross, the wonder of the promise, the wonder of the resurrection. It took more than a baby in a manger to save a race of sinners, and it took, it took a Savior on a cross. No life is saved and no story redeemed unless someone cares enough to be willing to go to the cross. And his name was Jesus. Jesus. When God demonstrated his own love for us, we were still yet sinners. But Jesus still came, Jesus still lived, and Jesus still died in spite of our sin and because of our sin. Christmas is not only the story of what once happened, but also a story of what is happening now. If we will open our hearts to the wonder of Christmas, we too can experience its reality and power and claim the promise for ourselves. Titus 3, 5 says this, He saved us not because of right, the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit. For it is with your heart, in Romans 10 says, that you believe and are justified, and with your mouth that you profess and receive this gift of God, and by faith you are saved. Do you want to unlock the wonder of the promise? Receive the gift that's most precious and most valuable, the gift of God through His Son and His promise, Jesus Christ. Would you bow your head? This morning, if you've never received that gift from God, I want to invite you in this moment.
to receive that gift. Romans 10 was very plain. If you believe in your heart that Jesus was the fulfillment of the promise that was given in Isaiah, the sign of the virgin birth, that Jesus was God made flesh and man, lived on this planet, died, was resurrected, and is God's son, and he wants to live in you. This morning, if you want to believe that and to receive that, and you shall be saved. Is there anyone this morning that would like to make that proclamation? You can do that just sitting there. And if you want me to pray for you, you can just slip your hand up. I'll pray for you. I see that hand. Are there others? Father, this morning as we come to you and we hear the rain pelting the roof, some of us feel life pelting us seems to be in a very hard way. We thank you, Lord, that there is a promise and a hope for a future. Sun will come out tomorrow. There will be brighter days. Through your hope, through your promise, through your love for us, we have a future. Let us never lose sight of that. Let us walk faithfully. Let us remember that we carry out the promise every day because you live in us. God with us. God with us. For we are the body of Christ. That's why we're called the body of Christ. We represent you. For we are your hands and your feet. Let us live out that promise each and every day. We pray this now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for watching. We would love for you to connect with us online. On our website, you will find up to date information about everything happening around here. Look for us on Facebook and Instagram. And please download our free app on your smartphone or tablet. We are so glad you're here, and we hope you enjoy your friendship experience.